The tried and true approach to digital photography is one, shoot raw, and two, develop in Lightroom. If that sounds right to you, then here are five fresh takes on some of the newest Lightroom features that you should be using every single day. I'm working in Lightroom, by the way. You Lightroom classic people can make the translations, and I'm working on a PC. Now, I'm not saying these features are necessarily brand new, but they have appeared in the last couple of years, and I want to bring them into sharper focus, beginning with denoise, which is a kind of miracle feature, frankly, that's also destructive, which is a rarity inside of Lightroom. I'm actually in the water with this creature, by the way, but I'm not insane, so I'm in a cage, which which means there's thankfully a little bit of distance. It's moving very quickly, low light, high ISO. And so not surprisingly, we have a whole lot of noise. I'll bring open the detail panel right there and there's D noise. Now it's not gonna be available when working with JPEG or TIFF images. You have to have a raw image, including Apple Pro Raw captured with an iPhone. And so I'll go ahead and click on Denoise and then I'll click and hold inside this preview right here and bring it down. This is before and this is after. And so notice after we've got this nice oval representing the eye. So it's really rebuilding the contours of these shapes. Whereas before it's mostly a random collection of pixels right there, but even that highlight on the inside is nice and round. And that's a function of AI being brought into play, which is awesome. However, here's the thing, this denoise amount value right here, that's the destructive part. You can't go back and tweak it like you can every single other value you apply in Lightroom. And so what I'm gonna have to do is apply more denoising. I'm gonna bring this value up to 70, let's say. And so here's before and here's after. And then I'll go ahead and click enhance. You may see a couple of progress bars. The first one's telling you that Lightroom is enhancing the detail and the second one shows you that it's applying denoise. And yet once things are wrapped up, we still have the noise and that's because because this is a destructive modification, Lightroom has saved a copy of the image as enhanced NR. And so I'll just go ahead and bring open that one and zoom on in and you can see it's much smoother. However, denoise is now dimmed because it's already been applied to this photo, meaning you cannot tweak that value. If you want to apply a different value, you'll have to go back to the original image. However, this is still such a great feature. Notice this this guy, he's so far away that he's more noise than shark. And yet I can click on denoise right here and then I'll just drag him over, very noisy. And then when I release, he's much smoother than he was before, but that's not enough, let's say. So I'm just gonna go ahead and crank it up to a hundred, at which point we go from an extraordinarily appallingly noisy image to one that is very smooth indeed. All right, this guy is a appropriately terrifying, except he's got a fish coming out of his chin. And by the way, if you're enjoying these photographs, take a moment to subscribe, won't you? If they're too terrifying, then don't. Now, we've not only got this chin fish, but we have a couple of fish upstairs as well that I'm gonna get rid of using the remove tool. Notice that generative AI these days, new feature, is turned on by default. It's a great function, but it's not the kind of thing you wanna use on a regular basis, especially for just tiny you know, fixes here and there. And so turn it off because otherwise it can introduce problems and it also takes a generative credit. And you may only have a few hundred of those, so, you know, per month. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and paint this guy and it'll just source locally, which works out perfectly. And then I'll just paint this guy away as well. My brush is a little bit too big for this tiny fish in front of the snout, so I'll make it smaller and click. And then I've got a little guy down there as well, which is all very well and good, but this isn't gonna work that well for the chinfish. Notice if I go ahead and paint it away and I wanna make sure that I surround the entire thing and I can't just paint like that. I've gotta go ahead and complete the brush stroke like so. And then I'll release and not only do we have a lump right here, but we've got a little extra fish, sort of a faded fish artifact left behind and I don't want that. So I'll go ahead and undo that change. There's another fish down here, isn't there? So I'll paint that away without generative AI turned on and then for the chinfish, I'm gonna go ahead and turn on generative AI again, 
It's great. It only takes one credit per brushstroke. It's not a big deal. However, you just don't want to be using it all the time. And also, I want to turn on detect objects because that way I can go ahead and encircle this fish like so. So I can just go ahead and make sure the entire thing is covered by my brush stroke and then release and it should get bigger like so, which it did. So the brush stroke is now encapsulating the entire fish. I like it, so I'll just click remove. So you do have that moment to revise the brush stroke if you like, and it all happens very quickly and the fish goes away entirely and we have a smooth chin in its wake. All right, now let's talk about HDR, which just keeps getting better and better inside Lightroom. Let's say you're working with an SDR display. That is no problem. I'm actually recording this image in SDR, by the way, and you'll still be able to see the difference. If you've been shooting raw all these years, you're sitting on top of tons of HDR images and you should be developing them accordingly. Consider this image that I captured seven years ago. It contains 10 bits of data per channel. Now SDR tops out at eight bits of data per channel, meaning you have at most 16.8 million colors. Just by adding those two bits, per channel, you go into the billion color territory. And so you can actually see what's going on just by clicking on this HDR button. But first I want you to note, these lips around the creature's maw. Just imagine how much of your body could fit inside this cavernous mouth. But still, they're not really lips, but you can see that they look a little bit kind of blown out. They're not really. We don't have that many blown highlights. I'll go ahead and alt drag this white slider right here. So you can see those are clipped highlights right there. So few and far between, but still we have these flat looking lips. And if you want to bring out that detail, all you have to do is click on this HDR button right here and notice how things light up, especially in this territory up toward the nostrils. So this is before in SDR territory. This is after, because I'm recording SDR, things are gonna be a little posterized, but that's okay, I can tell the story. For example, let's say you'd like to visualize what's going on with HDR. Well, up here in the histogram, SDR is now only taking up the left half. Whereas the HDR blocks right here, which are divided into four so-called stops, this is actually a logarithmic pro projection, so they get way bigger than this. However, you can see each one of the stops by turning on Visualize HDR, just if you want to. And that way, you can tell that cyan is the first stop and then blue. How do you know that? Because we have this key right here, this color key. So the first stop is cyan, blue, purple, and magenta. And each one is increasingly bright, by the way. Now, you might not be able to see them all. For example, even though I'm working on an HDR display, it is true black 400 is the standard. And so it's kind of an entry level display where HDR is concerned. And so if I hover over this clipping item right here, then you can see anything that yellow is stuff I can see on my monitor. I can make it out. And anything that is red is beyond the capabilities of this display. And yet we still have some distinction going on in this red zone. There's so much more to this. If you want to sort of see how things are going to look for the SDR people, which is of course 99% of the people still, then turn on preview for SDR display. That is going to mute the colors, but we still have all kinds of tonal distinction going on. Also notice right here that we have a curve and just the bottom left quadrant is devoted to SDR. The rest is HDR. It goes on and on. We have export options. If you would like to see me devote an entire week to this very exciting topic, just comment below. I am dying to share. Hey, real quick, everything that you can do in Lightroom, you can likewise do using a combination of Camera Raw and Photoshop. Why use those apps instead? Because every so often, new technology shows up in Camera Raw before it does in Lightroom. To learn more, join me at my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash deeknow. And now, back to the best of the newest stuff in Lightroom. All right, now let's move from sharks to people recognition inside of Lightroom, starting with this curious new preference setting. It's this guy right here, Enable People View, which is thankfully turned off by default, because were you to turn it on, Lightroom would analyze your photos to create models of faces in order to group similar faces together. I get it. That might have a high convenience factor. After all, you could track a specific person across multiple photographs. 
Were we living in a perfect world free of any repercussions? However, by enabling this feature, you are letting us know that it's okay for Adobe, like Adobe and us are separate groups, to create these models on your behalf, suddenly you're roped into it, and that you have approval from the individuals featured in your photos because surely you do. After all, who doesn't want to contribute to global facial recognition, in this case on behalf of a single corporate entity? That's insane. I'm going to cancel out. And it has nothing to do with Lightroom's ability to automatically select people. And so here we are looking at a stock photo from the Dreamstime Image Library. Link in the description. We have three clearly identifiable people. I say that because they're clearly identifiable to us and to Lightroom. And so I'll go ahead and click on masking over here. And notice if I expand people that we're seeing each one of the people. There's person one, there's person two, and there's person three. I just want you to see that Lightroom can see them. I'm going to select person two right there, the boy in the middle, at which point I can select the entire person or, for example, just his clothes. After which point, of course, I could create a mask and then I could adjust that region independently of the rest of the image. So whatever you do. Don't feel bullied into turning on enable people view. If you leave it off, I'm guessing the people around you will thank you. I'm going to wrap things up with a look at what's new in Lens Blur, which allows you to apply a kind of depth of field effect in post. I'm looking at an image that I captured with an iPhone to the Apple Pro RAW format. Could just as easily be JPEG for this one. I'll turn on apply and I end up turning the wrong portion of the image out of focus, as you can see right here. So the foreground is very much in focus. The background is not. However, this does allow me to show you the bokeh effects, including this last one, anamorphic, which is new. It's associated with lenses used in filmmaking ever so apparently. I, however, want to work with bubble because it's a good demo and I want to change what's in focus and what's out. Notice this focus range slider, nears on the left, far is on the right. Pretty straightforward. You have this target tool right here. So I'll select it and then I'll click on the flat irons because I want them to be in focus like so. Very simple. I also want to tighten the range. So I'll drag this guy over. So just the flat irons and the clouds are in focus. And next I will crank up this new cat eye feature right here, the slider all the way to a hundred. And what it does is it creates kind of crescents. Can you see those that rotate around the perimeter of the image? I'll go ahead and zoom in right there so you can see what I'm talking about. Notice these little guys are going kind of down into the left. And then if I zoom in on this bush over here on the left hand side, they're going down and to the right. And they look kind of like that effect you get when capturing shadows during an eclipse. You know what I'm talking about? Surely you do. And while I don't think this is necessarily an essential feature that you'll use every single day, it is awfully darn cool. So what do you think? Accolades, criticism, utter disgust, comment below. And then subscribe and turn on notifications so you know all the exciting, dare I say, essential stuff that's coming next. And for how things work inside Photoshop combined with Lightroom, join me at patreon.com slash deke now, and then go to deke.com and sign up for my newsletter. I'm Deke McClellan. This is Deke Now.